First, let me just give a, a tiny bit of a frame on, on, on what we're going to talk about today. I'm, I'm a historian. My PhD is in European history. And right now, I'm teaching a big university-wide course on the history of leadership. Now, that means a couple of things. It means, first, that I actually get paid to read other people's mail. That's the first thing. But the second thing it means is, in this course, Power and Glory in Turbulent Times, the History of Leadership from uh, Henry V to Mark Zuckerberg, we actually don't really have a lot of guests. Because until we get to the like, sort of late 20th century, they're all dead. So I, I work on stories. I work inductively. I work on stories. And I'm interested, my, my, my storytelling and my story reconstruction as a historian um, is primarily about individuals who discover, if you will, their stronger, better selves in the midst of great crisis, hence the title of this talk, Crisis Leadership Lessons for Here and Now. Um, and I have two stories to tell you today. And if I don't get too over-caffeinated and ahead of myself, we'll have some time for questions and answers, but I make no promises. Um, so so the, the first thing to, to give you as a frame is about our moment, because I'm, I'm an unabashed, if you will, kind of user of the past. I'm interested in these stories, not for their own purity and their, and, their and their narrative drama. Those are interesting. I'm interested because what do they offer us today in our own extremely turbulent moment? So you, we've all heard this now. We've been hearing it for about two years, not four years, not five years, two years. The turbulence is the new normal. It's all around. It's social. It's technological. It's political. It's geopolitical. It's, I, used to, I can't say the word meteorological, but it's twos with weather too, right? It's going to be 117 in Arizona today. So everywhere, it's turbulence. And that means a couple of things from a historian's point of view, from someone who gets paid to look at the large arc of history. It means first that we need a new frame. We need a new frame. We need a new operating system. Because the old search, which we're still seeing everywhere, whether we look at any kind of economic reports or we look at you know, the, the business press's coverage of, the stock, of stock market volatility all over the world, right? where it's, the Fed is not America's banker, it's the world's banker. No matter where we look, we are searching for some kind of punctuated equilibrium, some kind of stable template to peg today's happenings on. We'll rip that off because it's over. That's the first thing. Second thing it means is we're going to need this frame in which it's not so much about, oh my God, what does this mean? But you know, let's get ready for it. You know, let's let's be prepared for it. Let's prepare the unex. Let's prepare, and expect, prepare for and expect the unexpected. But the third implication of this, of all this turbulence, I was, I was at an Estee Lauder leadership offsite a few a few days ago and. I, would do, I used to do a lot of work for Estee Lauder before 2008, and they gave me a lot of free makeup, which was fabulous. But, but, but Fabrizio Freda, the CEO, said, look, this moment is about VUCA. And I like this word because it sounds like what it is. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So all this VUCA means, number three, that, that information and more information right, does not equal Knowledge and knowledge does not equal understanding, and understanding does not equal wisdom. What we need is the translation of less information into knowledge and then further into understanding, and most importantly, into wisdom. Because nothing, you know, in some sense, nothing more is needed and nothing less will do to take advantage of the promise and mitigate the peril of the, the eight to ten years we have right now. Make no mistake about it, folks. It's 8 to 10. It's not 20. It's not 25. It's 8 to 10. The window is no bigger. It may be smaller than that, in which the stakes are enormously high about how we, as a global village, navigate into the possibility of this next century. Notice why I said navigate into the possibility. So the fourth thing, we need wisdom. The fourth thing it means is that a whole lot depends on effective leadership, which we hear so much about, it's, like, it's become like a cliche. And I, I get tired of the word leadership, but I want to give you a definition that I think has some meat to it. And ironically, or perhaps unusually, it comes from David Foster Wallace, right? the, the wonderful and very, very talented American novelist who I never could read his books because the sentences are kind of like German. They're like you know, 107 words and a verb at the end. But, but, but he wrote some really, for me, readable nonfiction. And one of the fabulous essays he wrote is called Up Simba. And he was, he was writing a story about the first John McCain presidential campaign. Long ago, 
right? When, jo- when, the, when the ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching of the political marketplace did not seem so powerful and so entrenched. And he wrote this definition of leaders, effective leaders. He said, effective leaders are individuals who, th- who help us overcome the limitations of our own weaknesses and selfishness and fears and get us to do harder, better, more important things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. Leaders are individuals who help us overcome the limitations of our own selfishness and weaknesses and fears and get us to do harder, better, more important things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. And aren't we searching like thirsty pilgrims through the desert for that right here, right now? Okay, so those are, if you will, my four appetizer dishes. I want to tell you two stories. These are part of a book I've been working on for, oh God, it's about 10 years. It's the long, tortured pregnancy. And... I just need to abandon this book now and get it out into the world. And it's due at the, it's due at the publishers in about four months. So, so, so blessedly, the baby will be born. But I want to talk about two different leaders in the moment of great crisis, personal as well as, if you will, you know, larger national, um, international in this case of the second person we're going to look at. And I want to talk a little bit about their stories and what the lessons are of those stories. And you know, it's, it, this is an ironic first shot because this story is so not about a man in marble. This is about Lincoln, you know. The world doesn't need another book on Lincoln, so I have a, I have a small story to tell about him. Um, but, but the point is that these, these are stories of great humanity, of individuals who were made in the crises, partly by some kind of choice to be made and keep walking, to be made and keep walking. Um, so let me begin with just a few little you know, things you know already but are not, are not, I think, unworthy of repetition. So as we all know, Lincoln was born to hard-scrabble parents. He, he didn't, Thomas, Thomas Lincoln and then Nancy Hanks, he didn't like his father from the very get-go, right? They were like oil and water. And Lincoln was, in many ways, you can see his journey, as, especially his young adulthood and his search for power and his search for recognition, as very largely about getting distance on his father, right? When he was nine, as many of you know, his mother died, Nancy Hanks. She, like Thomas Lincoln, was, um, could not read. And, he, and his, his father immediately married a woman, well, almost immediately married a woman that he had courted once long ago, named Sarah Bush Johnston. She's really important because she encourages the abstract and, and, and yet you know, thoughtful and, 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 and often shy but very, very serious young man that, Abraham, that Abe Lincoln is. And she encourages him to study and read and borrow books and all those legendary tales we remember about Lincoln from our high school history classes. But here's the first point, the first point in this presentation. Lincoln, as many of you know, had less than a year of formal schooling, but almost all of what he learned, he learned as an autodidact. I think he's one of the greatest examples of a self-taught leader that we have. And he didn't learn it in some kind of you know, to, to my, to my you know, heartbreak, he didn't learn it in some kind of great, like, you know, great curriculum, great ideas kind of form. He learned it purely on a need-to-know basis. So he taught himself surveying when he was looking for employment. He taught himself retailing, right, when he was in New Salem. He taught himself geometry. He taught himself um, law when he wanted to become a lawyer. He taught himself in 1860 and 1860, 1861 and 1862 and 1863 military strategy because the Union generals wouldn't fight. He taught himself a lot. And he understood, and this is perhaps the first offering, if you will, my first breadcrumb on our path, he understood that you pull knowledge and that adversity and moments of turbulence are actually moments when we are most porous and we want to work the hardest to learn. So for him and his journey, for him and his journey all of life's turbulence was a continuous classroom. Um, when he hits his majority at 21, he hightails it out of his father's orbit. He ends up in a place called New Salem that ironically has hardly been written about in the overcrowded literature on Lincoln. My point about putting this slide up, and this is a re- reconstruction of the village there, is that Lincoln spent eight years in this small 100-family village northwest of Springfield. And here, he starts trying on all kinds. He's very, very, very self-aware. The most important aspect that we need to carry away from Lincoln is how he used, in an age before we talked about emotional awareness, before we talked about EQ, how he used his own knowledge of himself to grow and lead and have impact. 
But in, in New Salem, he tries on a whole lot of careers. He's a, you know, he, as I said, he was a disaster as a retailer twice. He ended up with lots and lots of debt that he called the national debt, eventually discharged it. Um, but he also, he also tries on surveying. He's a, he, he delivers the mail, which gives him a chance to read newspapers. He starts to learn to speak. He joins a, you know, a, a, a debating society almost immediately. So just a second, stop here. Almost immediately, he decides to run for the state legislature. So you are Abraham Lincoln, and you're 22 years old, and you're, you're a lousy dresser. He was always a poor dresser until he got to be president. I'll say one or two more things about Lincoln that we don't know so well as we go along. You, you're, you're, you, you know, you're, you're from the backwoods, right? And you get here, and you, you see all kinds of people, right? Lawyers and doctors and farming, farming, farmers and coopers and blacksmiths. And you get the idea that you can run for office. I mean, this man had some serious ambition. Right, this man puts my Harvard MBAs to shame in terms of his drive. In many, many ways, his, his future and long-term law partner, William Herndon, would say Lincoln's ambition was a little engine that knew no rest. So you can't really understand Lincoln and his willingness to be made without understanding the sheer drive to rise and to get recognition. It was never really about money. It was about power and recognition. And so this is a very important time. And by the time he leaves New Salem, in the early, late 1830s, by the time he leaves New Salem and, and gets ready to go to Springfield, he has taught himself the law, he is ready to tie and take the bar, and he has been elected. He, he did not win on his first attempt. He has been elected to the state legislature, and he has started to build a network of people that will support him all the way to the White House. Um, this is his law office in Springfield. He had three law partners before he settled on Herndon for 17 years. One, only one thing to say here, again, back to Lincoln growing. He started out, he was always a good speaker. He taught himself to speak. He was a good speaker. High-pitched voice. He used to stand there like this, wave his hands. It's so one place, start off slow, and then build some momentum in this very high voice. Um, so he's always a good speaker, and he, could he thought he could carry juries with his speaking ability, but he learns very quickly that that's quite, not quite enough. And so one very early example of Lincoln being made as a lawyer is how he figures out, uh, uh, again, the self-awareness, the, the way that he could both contain and use his ambition is so interesting. He, he figured out, and he said this later to a bunch of law students, uh, he said, if I can convince the jury, right, on three, the three points or the two points on which the case rests, I will win the case. But in, I don't need to win all the other points. I can just give them away and disarm disarm the opposing counsel. So the early on, this, very, this sense of you know, when you give and when you take, um, and, 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 and this, this, this ability, and here's perhaps our second, if you will, kind of pearl to pick up from the grass, this ability to walk outside himself. So Lincoln, all through his life, from his first days as a lawyer, all the way to Appomattox, to those late nights walk in those halls like Spielberg and Tony Kushner have got exactly right in the movie. Um, he could have the ability to walk all around himself and his place. Very, very important. And something I, I think that every person, all these leaders in my book who were made in crisis had. I worry a little bit that our love affairs with our technology, our reactive default mode is keeping us from stepping away from who we are, what we're doing, how we might make a bigger commitment to something like goodness or to, some, to the higher road. So anyway, Lincoln's a lawyer. He starts, he, he, he starts, starts rising in the political orbit of central growing Illinois. So this is actually my favorite portrait of Lincoln. It's called the Danville portrait. It was taken about the time he was married in the early 1840s. He looks almost handsome. Um, I think he was handsome at times. You can see the dreamy eyes, the way he could be very, very distracted, as he often was. He could fall out of conversation. You also see the intent, you know, the intensity and the thoughtfulness of his gaze and his hair, which was perpetually a mess. Um, that's not like a bumble and bumble styled hair, you know, hairstyle. That's Lincoln, always a little bit disheveled, again, until Brooks Brothers and the White House. Um, and, and one other kind of, again, small, less known thing, less known aspect of Lincoln. Um, he, women liked him. He understood, he, he, understood, he understood how to be, he liked women. He understood in some sense how to attract them, mostly by a very quiet, kind of unassuming, kindly way. He was very kind. He was a kind person. So if you think about the bloodshed 
of the Civil War, what that, what, what that must have wrought on a sensitive and kind man. Um, he, and so women were attracted to him. And in Springfield, he, like in New Salem, he starts trying on right, different, if you will, kind of ways of being with women. And he was by no, means, uh, by no means a kind of you know, bachelor, you know, American bachelor or anything like that. But, but, but he, is, he, 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 was a so, he, he was very good in social circles, in, even though he worried about his position. Um, oops, excuse me. He, he marries, he meets and marries, in, in, again, in the early 1840s, Mary Todd Lincoln, who has had a very tortured history with historians. The point here is that she was smart, she was ambitious, she was well-educated, she was politically aware, and until the war and the death of their second son, they lost, their third son, they lost two sons, they had four, they lost Eddie, their second son, in Springfield, and 12 years later, in, as the movie captures so well, they lost Willie, their third son. Before the war and, and grief drove them apart, Lincoln never made a decision without her. So it's important to remember that it always takes a village, and no leader does it by, by him or herself. And she's very, very important in this story. Um, she was five foot one. He was six four. He used to say, "We're really about the long and the short of it." And she's a absolutely, and she's a very, very important dri driver for his ambition. When he flags, he got depressed a lot. We know something about that from different historians, including Joshua Shank's book, Lincoln's Melancholy. Today, he would have been medicated, Wellbutrin, Prozac, um, no question, no question. But she was very important in pulling him out of what he called the hypo. So again, remember, you know, just as some, this life, right? This just just like all of our lives. It's mostly. Difficult moments and gray matter punctuated by joy and all the small and real things every day that define us. Um, he was a devoted father. This is actually a shot of him with his youngest son, Thomas, or Tad, during the White House. And, one of, and Lincoln and, 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 and Mary shared three things, again, on the side of what we don't know so much about. First, they shared his political ambition. She always said, I wanted to marry someone who would be president. Secondly, they shared an astounding, very modern, you know, attitude about their children. They did not discipline them. Friends hated their kids because they were so unruly. Um, but they also shared, a ver for off very often, a very rich, good, solid set physical life. Um, and, and, yet, and they fought often and, and dramatically, but there's no question that they were a very, very, if you will, very, very much a team going into the White House. In 1860, after a whole string of defeats, so Lincoln's, if you will, late 40s, are just kind of one defeat after another politically. His law practice goes, he becomes a rich man by, by the standards of the time. He always understood money. And when he died, Mary and Robert, her, his oldest son, had plenty of money. But he was really interested in politics. But it's a, series, it's a string of depressions, and, of, of setbacks and consequent depressions through 1847 and 1849, even though he's in Congress but goes nowhere with that and is met by cosmic indifference, through the early 19, 1850s when he's back at practicing law and no traction again in terms of you know, being, being nominated for the Senate. He loses a very important race to Stephen Douglas for US, Senate, for U.S. Senator from Illinois. And then... Beginning in the 1850s, and really in the 1855, after something called the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the boiling cauldron of slavery kind of overflows, right? Spills over, and Lincoln, as he once said, was moved and galvanized as I had never been moved before. And he's back on the national scene, again, defeated in 1858 after a series of important debates that he self-publishes that bring him onto the national scene. And in 1860, the newly formed Republican Party pulls Lincoln out of the West as a kind of underdog possibility. And then, ironically, in, he's, a, he's nominated on the third ballot with lots and lots of patronage and not, lots and lots of work by his handlers in the Chicago Republican Convention. And then in a four-way race between Stephen Douglas and two candidates that split off uh, that were pro-slavery, Lincoln is elected president in November of 1860 and the old adage, when God wants to punish you, he answers your prayers, right, certainly comes true because almost immediately all these states succeed. So we know that. And we know that Lincoln takes office in 1861, March 4th, with an astounding speech if you compare it to the second inaugural. So if I do nothing else today, let me send you to, send me, send you to the internet to look at a couple of his speeches. The first speech is a plea to the South, a reasoned but unabashed plea for the South to stay in the Union. We are friends. I am loath to close. We must not be enemies. And, but the, but it is, it, you know, it's astounding in what he's asking and promising. 
Um, and then the second inaugural where he's explaining the war and why it was worth all the blood it cost. Interestingly enough, the capital dome is not finished. One of the first major expenditure authorizations that Lincoln will make in 1861 and 1862 is for the dome to be completed as a sign of national unity and for the transcontinental railroad to be built. For the first four months that Lincoln is in office, his, his handlers, his cabinet, which with Doris Kearns Goodwin has written about, team of rivals, his rivalrous cab cabinet, composed of people with many more cash and many more, much more connections and, and experience than he, right, are surprised by how generally unable Lincoln is to do very much. So this is not the story of the man in the marble who steps in and says, let me add it, in terms of dealing with the Civil War. He is, he is he's unsure what to do. He doesn't know who to trust. He doesn't know, you know what he has in terms of an army and resources. And, and he doesn't have the will on the northern side that the South has. And so the story of late 1861 into 1862 is really the story of a man under extraordinary strain, extraordinary strain, um, and, and not a lot of effective action. And he is stymied at every turn, he feels, by Union generals that simply won't fight. By 1860, late eight, early 1862, right before his son, second son will die, he is basically trying to take over, kind of running, literally, socks for the soldiers, muskets for Union troops, the grand strategy of the war from this office at the center of the White House. It's captured absolutely accurately in the Spielberg movie. So you see it, and the maps are on the side, the corner desk that you can't see is where he stood in the movie and waved the clock, and, 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 and waved the clock back and forth in one of the many, many moments that he didn't sleep, that he was full of reflection. Um, let me go back one second. So, so I guess the third pearl I would offer is how Lincoln was able to navigate through his own grave doubts. And they were grave indeed. We know from Stanton and other people that knew him well, the two most important protagonists in that respect are his secretaries, these young men, John Nicolay and John Hay, who are in the movie, very well portrayed, that he trusted. We know that he, was in, he, he, he lived in grave doubt. We know he didn't sleep. We know he walked the halls singing bawdy Scottish ballads. Um, we know he had spindly legs and long yellow nightshirts. We know that he agonized. We know from Stanton, his second Secretary of War, who came, who came in prepared to hate Lincoln and grew to be one of his most loyal advisors, that Lincoln threatened to kill himself at least twice during the Civil War. So this is not the brave man in the marble. This is not the, the way we think of Lincoln when we think about the Gettysburg Address. This is someone who is teetering on shaky floorboards of doubt for a lot of his presidency. And per, no, at no point more seriously, more seriously than in early 1862. His son dies. He can't get anywhere with his plans for compensated emancipation and dealing with, 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 with slavery and, and, and a divided Congress, divided Republican Party, ardent Democrats that want him to, you know, to, to, to basically embrace slavery and, and, and forget all this abolitionist stuff. Abolitionists that are furious. He is very encumbered. And then a series, a series of one of many in this swinging pendulum of military advantage, a series of defeats um, I, with Lee at the helm, a series of Union defeats in June bring him to some kind of point that I believe put him his back up against the wall in a way that is simply, there's no other moment in, the, in his presidency. And from that moment, in that moment, so make it late May, early June, we can't date it exactly, but we can see what comes out of that. In that moment comes his leadership backbone. In that moment comes this, and this brings us to the fourth pearl, this extraordinary commitment to I will save the Union. I will save it with every single card I can play. He later would say that. And I will save it. I will save it. He didn't yet know that he would def redefine it as in the saving. He's not there yet. right? He's being made the story of America between 1861 and 1865 is about the transformation of Abraham Lincoln. He doesn't know what he's going to do, but he will save it. So, so the fourth pearl is this extraordinary commitment, this you know, ineluctable adherence or hewing to the mission in the face of great subtlety, su excuse me, suppleness and flexibility about the how I will do it. So that's a really important aspect of leading in turbulence. We're going to do it. We're going to Damascus. We're going to save the Union, but how we do it, we'll have lots of adaptability and, and flexibility about that. So in 1862, in June, 
Lots of dispute about exactly when this happens, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. He begins drafting, all on his own, the Emancipation Proclamation. Now remember, a month earlier he's saying, let's just buy up all the slaves, we'll pay the owners, and we'll send them to the Caribbean. That's Lincoln's solution to the slave problem, to the, to the problem of the Negro, as it was called, in 1862. But by July, early July, July 9th, he walks into a cabinet meeting right, with all his rivals and his now slowly grudging supporters and says, here, gentlemen, I want you to, I'm going to present this to you. I don't want your advice on whether to do it. I've made up my mind. I want your advice on its presentation. And he presents the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, we don't need to go into kind of double click on the Emancipation Proclamation in terms of what it, what it was doing and why and where it came from in terms of like the, 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 the if you will, the, the military exigency. It was clearly, as he said later to Francis Carpenter, a painter who came to paint the scene of the, of the, of the presentation of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1864, lived in the White House for six months. He said, I had I'd, I'd come to the end of my game. I had, I, had, I had one last jack to play, and I did. And so in September, at the urging of William Seward, his Secretary of State, who said, don't present it now, present it after you have a, you have a Union victory, at Antietam, which was a pirate victory, 23,000 Union and Confederate soldiers killed or wounded in one day, he presents the Emancipation Proclamation, and the whole game begins to change. And from that moment, because Lincoln was a calculating, serious, thoughtful, detached person, Right? Walk, calculating, walking, looking, like any of us looking at the Mike, Michelangelo's David in the academia. Hmm, what's it look like over here? What's it look like over there? Once he's done this, as he said later in a speech you really must look up, um, a, a, a speech in Springfield um, in 1864, he says, the promise being made must be kept. The promise of emancipation being made must be kept. So the Emancipation Proclamation, which Lincoln embraces with increasing thoughtfulness and depth. It's not a linear thing. It's a steady, it, but it's steady, and it's deep, and it's action by action, becomes, if you will, this whole new template, this whole new cast to the struggle to save the Union. And, by 18, and it opens the door to military uh, conscription and enlistment for, from, from black Americans. It opens the door to a brand new kind of covenant, if you will, about these United States. It changes all. But it's not a giant bolt from, from, the, from, the, uh, from the heavens. And so, again, you know, the ability to, to, stay, to, to not fall through the floorboards of doubt, to find something, would that President Obama would find his backbone. We're all waiting for it. I'm serious, we are. Would that he would find it. Lincoln found it. Doesn't fall through the floorboards of, of doubt, although there'll be lots and lots of moments of doubt to come. And then a whole bunch of things start to happen. right? And, and let me just for a second show you the things we don't see very much about Iraq or Afghanistan. So this was the first war in modern history that's photographed and that happens at close range. I'm just going to show you a few shots. These are from Antietam and Gettysburg, so that's September of 1862 and July of 1863. So in Gettysburg, in, in July of 1863, so we're now 150 years, three days, 150,000 troops from both sides converge. 50,000 are killed and wounded in three days of fighting. And it's, a, and, and it's declared a Union victory, but it's a very, very ambiguous victory. And it sits very uneasy with Lincoln because the commanding general, George Meade, could have chased, if he thought his army was you know, kind of physically fit enough, could have chased Lee across the Potomac and ended the war at that point. And Lincoln is frustrated and angry and full of vitriol about this. And he writes a caustic, angry letter to George Meade. And then he puts it in an envelope. And on the, on the, on the, on the top of the envelope, he writes, to George Meade, never sent. You can actually look this up on the internet as well. It's there. It's in his handwriting. It's been digitized. And it was found after the war by his secretaries. And I keep thinking about, if you will, the fifth pearl here, which is this kind of forbearance that he had, the ability to not necessarily react, even when he was all churned up, if that action, if that reaction would compromise his mission. So imagine for a second if Lincoln had had email. Imagine, right? He's angry. He's frustrated. He hits send. 
But he couldn't have afforded at that moment, Grant and Sherman hadn't yet emerged from the mist to be the men he needed who would fight, who would pay the price of a Union victory in terms of the lives that would be lost. They haven't come yet. He can't alienate the West Point brass. He simply can't do it. So the course of, if looking at that email, the course of history might have been very different. As you all know, in 1863, he makes a speech about the ambiguity of that victory uh, called, in the Gettysburg Address, and he's the kind of backup band for the main speaker, Edward Everett. Speech lasts less than two minutes. So this is the only photograph we have of him near the podium. Lincoln is actually number two. You can see him just above the number two. The photographer was so busy setting up his tripod, and it, the speech was so quick that he didn't have time to get Lincoln actually saying it. This is Lincoln stepping down. Now, the point of that speech, and this is, if you will, pearl number six, is that that speech is, a, is, the most, is just an astounding example of what we need leaders of all shapes and sizes, of all kinds of organizations to do, even, even leaders of families to do right now, and that is to frame the stakes of the moment. Think about the speech, where we came from, what we're doing right here, right now, why we're doing it, and what it's costing us, what the trade-offs are, why that matters in the large picture of not just the United States, but perhaps, right, perhaps the larger world, and ultimately why those trade-offs are worth making. Again, O oh for leaders, more than we have right now that would do that. Um, okay, so this is one of many, many, about 300 cemeteries conducted constructed in, during the, on the Union side for the war dead. So here's the raw arithmetic we're talking about. So if you just look here, I don't really do matrices very well. Once I got tenure at the Harvard Business School, I didn't really have to worry about them. That and sports statistics no longer had to take a lot of my time. Um, but down here, it's 1.1 million people um, killed or wounded on both sides. Those numbers have actually recently been revised upward with some pretty good uh, evidence behind them. So we're probably talking about a few probably closer to 1.5 million Americans killed or wounded. The way that that really comes home to us is when we remember that the population of America was about 32 million during the Civil War. So it's 3%. So that's about 9 million people today if we kind of you know, amplify it to the relative proportions of our time. So this war, this war and Lincoln's ability to keep on keeping on through this war, just keep doing this, the resilience here, pearl number seven, the resilience, the endurance. I worry a lot as a historian that we're not teaching our kids enough about endurance and you know, just resilience and persistence in our sort of you know, more, now, more new now moment. Um, so here's a picture of Lincoln. Here's some pictures of Lincoln. So just to look again back at the individual leader. Right, so this is Lincoln right before he was nominated for the Republican nomination. So this is spring of 1860. This is Lincoln in November of 1863, just after the Gettysburg Dress. And this is Lincoln about a month before he was assassinated. So again, the fact that he was so resilient physically, that he could recover you know, with Shakespeare and animals he loved, kittens and dogs, and, and body Scottish ballads, right? All those, and, 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 you know, and joking with his secretaries, that was incredibly important. The fact that he endured really, really was enormously important. One last thing I want to say about Lincoln. Now, I want to turn to another story. How am I doing? Okay, good. So, because I want to tell you another story, and then I want to perhaps leave time for questions. So, because there's overlap here from these stories, but they're very, very different, and they're very different kinds of people. I, somewhere in here, I mean, Lincoln, somewhere, somewhere in those four years, I think, again, I go back to 1862, I just think it's a bellwether period, that spring, late, that late spring, early summer. Somewhere in here, Lincoln got access to what I now call and talk to my students about. As I said, I just called it the leadership, his leadership backbone, but I, I think it's more accurately called our core. You know, I, I'm a horseback rider. I learned to ride very late as I was going through my first bout of breast cancer, and it really saved me. I went through a second bout as well, and I, I picked up riding with the five-year-olds and the ponies and the lead line, and then I graduated to the eight-year-olds, and then I finally got to the teenagers and, and jumping. And Anyway, you think when you start to ride, we think. We still do this, all of us, even experienced leaders, even experienced practitioners, even experienced you know, clinicians and healers. We think often that the solution to what we need and know we want to do is about the, the, the aids we have, right? It's often it's about our smartphone, right, and the magic answer's there, because technology is still controlling us. We haven't gotten yet to figure out how to, how to, how to use it on our terms. 
But you, we think it's about the aid. So if you're riding, you think it's about the crop, and you think it's about you know, your heels and your, and your spurs, and, oh, if I just hold my hand a little higher, the horse will turn. And then you get to be an intermediate rider, and you realize it's not about the crop at all. It's not about the heels. It's, it's about your core. It's about your, the center of who you are physically and emotionally and how you communicate with the horse and how important it is to literally show up right, in, with a strong core and how the horse senses the smallest movement. Just like all the people that every person in this, office, in this room has impact on are looking at you and trying to sense your core, because we are so hungry for leaders of any shape and form, chemo nurses, teachers, librarians, cops, governors, mayors, business people, managers, floor managers, union officials. We are so hungry for people whose core is strong and has, last point about Lincoln, has the muscles of moral courage developed. Has found, that person has found them. Just like in a horse, you find how to shift your hip so the horse turns or pulls his, his, his haunches in. So, so Lincoln found his muscles of moral courage in 1862. And the rest of the time, and it's not that he doesn't doubt and agonize, he's, he, threatened, he says, I'm about as miserable as anyone can be in 1864 during the Battle of the Wilderness, which is, again, a string of Union defeats. It's not that he, it was a, you know, a kind of uninterrupted kind of vector upwards after 1862. It was that he could find this and go back to it over and over again in crisis and in doubt and not succumb. OK, so let me pause there with Lincoln. I'm going to tell you another very different story. So take a yoga breath, because we're going to fast forward now about, about 60 years. And I want to talk about a guy named Ernest Shackleton, who was an explorer in the Antarctic, who's, who basically failed at everything he did. Tried to discover the South Pole in 1908 and 1909. Couldn't get there, because they, they got too close to the end of their food reserves and had to turn back 100 miles north of the pole. Um, Tried to, tried to find the fame that, that he could no longer have after someone else had discovered the pole by walking across, set, setting up an, an expedition that would walk across the pole in 1913 and 1914 and 1915 and failed miserably at that. So he kind of failed at all the things he set out to do. And yet, in some very, very real sense, he succeeded in a very different, very unexpected kind of mission on this third, the third of his, his expeditions, what's called the Endurance Expedition. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail except to say he'd been to the pole a couple of times, I've been to Antarctica a couple of times in 1905 and 1906, and then again in 1908 and 1909. And then in 1913, he decides, I'm going to the pole again. It's already been discovered, so he can't get that glory. I'm gonna, we're going to walk across it. And this is a photograph, uh, a page from a London newspaper. You can't read that, I'm sorry, at the top, but it says, Seekers of, seekers of Fame, I'm sorry, bear with me, Seekers of the South Pole, great heroes of Antarctic exploration. And I put this up because it's such an inter interesting litmus or eye, litmus paper or eye into what counts for fame in a given moment. So if this were a page today, it would be like People Magazine's Most Beautiful People, right? Or it would be, you know, you know, American, you know, bachelor, the top 40 bachelors or the top 40 billionaires under 40. It would not be about exploration. And it would not be about the implicit patriotism that fueled some of that, not to mention the ego and narcissism and all the things that we all, and many of us, deal with in terms of drive. Um, so he was looking for, you know, looking for you know, acclamation and recognition, not unlike Lincoln. And, and in 1913, he sets, he sets off, he starts preparing for this journey. He does a lot of very detailed preparation, right? So the ability of leaders to have the vision, have the mission, but also toggle seamlessly back and forth to, between the small details that affect that. So he was brilliant at, at, at creating these, these mittens and these canvas straps. He created his own power bar. He had lots of food. He knew they needed to eat raw meat because he thought it was a prophylactic against scurvy. In many, many ways, he's very, very good at detailed preparations. Here's an example of the ad that he, we don't know where it ran, so this is a reconstruction. But take a look at this ad. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful. <laughs> Honor and recognition in case of success. Now this is not your typical kind of Craigslist ad. So what is he doing and why, why is that useful to us? And what does that have to do with turbulence? So, I think what he's doing, to use an overused expression, is he's actually hiring assembly. He really, he really created an ensemble of people to go on this expedition. He's assembling people based on their attitude rather than the kind of notches of skills on the resume. So hiring for attitude, hiring for people with a positive, can do, expect the unexpected, let's go, 
attitude towards change, and then training for skill. So he assembles these men, 27 plus himself. They sail, they set sail in, in August of 1914. War's broken out. He cables Winston Churchill, the second Lord of the Admiral Chain, and says, can we go? And Churchill says, you know, kind of phlegmatically, proceed. They hightail it out of London, head for South America to gather stores, and then head for the last outpost. Uh, so this is the tip of South America. They're heading southeast to a whaling station called South Georgia. And this picture is taken in December of 1914 there. That's Shackleton in the captain's hat and the men standing up. is his second in command, Frank Wilde. There's a whaling station down where you see the boats in the center. And the, whaling, the whalers say, don't possibly go south, uh, Captain Shackleton. There's way too many icebergs. And Shackleton absolutely disregards their advice and heads south. He's, out, he's getting out of Dodge. And so this is what the, the boat encounters, right, within a day or two of leaving the whaling station in late 1915 and early 19, I'm sorry, late 1914 and early 1915. It's a jigsaw puzzle. And they make their way almost to the coast of Antarctica, to the, nor, to the, to the east coast of Antarctica on the side of McMurdo Sound. And, 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 and Shackleton decides to sail down further south and, and west along the coast to get a better place to sort of create his base camp and in that decision, in mid-January 1915, the ship gets stuck in the ice. And it's stuck. Right? It's like, you know, it's like just literally choked in these icebergs. And, he, and, and so suddenly, he has a very different mission on his hand. So this is our winter, their summer. So it's 19, January 1915. And, the, and, the, and, there's, and there's no possibility of gunning the motors and getting out of this. He's stuck. Now suddenly, he has a very interesting issue on his, on his plate. How do you deal with the energy of a team that suddenly has nothing to do? So the seventh pearl here is how do we manage the energy of the people that look to us for direction or cues or love or guidance or moral courage? How do we manage the energy? And Shackleton was brilliant at this. He was just brilliant. I don't know why, I don't know how, but he was hardwired to this. So lots and lots of things he does. Very simple things, as Isaac Dennison would say. The small and the real of daily routine. That, and mothers understand this very well. You know, animal trainers understand this very well. He understood it with his men. So one thing we do, right, is we give everyone lot, you know, very specific duty, duty rosters, and we change the duty rosters every week to prevent boredom, ennui, doubt, disillusion, despair, destruction. So here's Chris Green, the cook, with dinner, right? Because they ate a lot of penguin, they ate a lot of seal. Here are the men having Christmas dinners. There was enough food, interestingly enough. They would be on the ice for almost two years, and there was enough food because he brought a lot of canned goods and they could find animals to eat. Uh, and, and he was a very, this is a kind of small note, but back to the small and the real. He understood, like most women understand, some men do, but most women are hardwired to do this, how you use food as literally as a leadership tool to fluff, to fluff a, you know, a weary child, to you know, reinvigorate a tired partner, to calm, right, to calm a, a, a crying, agitated baby. He used food in all kinds of ways, and including the importance of ritual and, 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 and the men having ceremonies, and again, having these kind of, if you will, rooted stakes to tie their, their, the, the, the tents of their emotional awareness and feeling to. Um, throughout the, with our summer, their winter of 1915, the boat starts to get choked by the ice. They abandon the boat in September of 1915 and cash three lifeboats from the Endurance, that's the name of the, the ship, and a bunch of stores on, the, on these floating bergs. And then, in November, the ice in one day swallows up the boat. It falls through, it closes over, and that night, like the title track to the last U2 album, there is no line on the horizon. So just imagine, folks, you've got 27 men, you've got a few dogs, right, who don't know how to sledge because Shackleton neglected to bring a dog trainer, and you have no GPS, you have no Google Maps, you have no, like, you know, square, you have no way of anyone knowing where and how you are. And so suddenly, he has a whole new mission on his hands. And interestingly enough, the next morning, the ship goes down. He writes in his diary, we know, just like Lincoln, he's really uncomfortable. He writes in his diary, ship and stores gone. No, I'm sorry. He writes in his diary, ship went down today. I cannot write about it. But the next morning, he doesn't walk out of his tent and say, you know, in a kind of in reality TV or kind of, you know, talk show moment, God, it's really bad, guys. I'm kind of worried. 
He walks out, he knocks on the, he pulls the tent flaps back of all the other men's tents with hot milk and says, ship and stores gone, lads. We'll go home now. So the eighth pearl I have for you is how do you show up every day? Shackled and understood, he was a good actor. He understood the power of his body language, you know, how he moved. He didn't have a smartphone that he was buried in. But he understood that how he showed up had huge impact on what the men thought their chances were and whether they would cohere or disintegrate. They are on the ice now. Here they are. He, by the way, he, lined, he, he pays very careful attention to tent assignments. So he puts all the doubting Thomases, there are at least five, very close to him, in tents right around him or in his tent. Keep your friends close, your enemies closer. Or as Lyndon Johnson once said in his inimitable poetry, it's better to have them inside the tent pee and out than outside the tent pee and in. <laughs> so this very, very careful management of the Doubting Thomases, and, and extremely careful. And there's lots of examples of how he mitigates, dilutes their toxicity, their negativity at lots of critical junctures. So they're on the ice. Octo October, November of 1915, December, January. February, March. So imagine, just icebergs, killer whales howling around, ice breaking up. They try a couple of times on the bergs to try and find water, to pull across the iceberg, pull the, the, the three lifeboats across. It, it, it fails miserably. And Shackleton, as soon as he sees something starting to fail, is trying to invent the next move, back to suppleness. Right? I'll try whatever I have to do to bring my men home. And, and so he tries all kinds of things. So if you will, the ninth pearl I have for you is about improv. He was a great improviser. You know, he wasn't a man of grand steps. He was a man of small steps, and he took them. Uh, he took them, and he, so he's constantly trying. When this doesn't work, and some of the men threaten to, to, to mutiny, the Doubting Thomases, he puts down the mutiny, promises to pay them until they get to London, and we move on. Um, in April, very end of March, and beginning of April, 1916. So imagine, right, we haven't touched dry land since South Georgia, December of 1914. The ice starts to break up, and they take to the lifeboats, hoping to sail. I don't have a map here, I'm sorry. But they're hoping to sail. If, if this is the coast of Antarctica, a big U, I should have put the map up. They are here on a floating berg, and they're hoping to sail northwest in order to find some islands in which a trading ship might come by very high in this archipel archipelago of islands that, that kind of enclose or wrap up the South America, the South, the South Pole continent, the Ant Antarctica. Terrible journey, eight days, dysentery, uh, water leaks into the, into the water barrels. The men are very ill, and Shackleton's forced to, to tuck in, to take land at an island very far, far south from any of the islands that might ever come into the kind of navigational stream of a trading ship. It's called Elephant Island. And the men arrive there in, 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 the, in the middle of April 1916. And here you see them. And they haven't even pulled the boats up, the three lifeboats up, before he's already thinking, what are we going to do? No one's going to find us here. He had to pull in because the men are dying. And he's like, I know what we'll do. We'll sail 800 miles north, get it straight, northeast back to the whaling station, South Georgia. And so he and his carpenter and his men fix up one of the lifeboats. It's 22 feet long, about five feet wide. They're fixing it up. They build up the sides. They put a, ma a mast on it. They put some tarp over it. And here they go through some of the world's, I don't sail, but understand these are serious sailing waters, through some of the world's most you know, turbulent seas, they're sailing with a sextant. I don't really know what a sextant is, but I know it's very difficult to navigate with. And you need calm because you need the line of the horizon and the sun. And so you look at this and you think, you're one, he takes, he takes five people. Three of them are doubting Thomases because he doesn't want to leave them sowing discord on Elephant Island with the other men. Sail off, and you look at this and you go, good luck. <laughs> and they sail, and it takes them about 20 days. And miraculously, it's, a, it's an extraordinary journey. I'll just give you one tiny tidbit. It's so awful. This story is like what Henry Kissinger once said. It, it's so extraordinary, and yet it has the added advantage of being true. And one tidbit, uh, one of the men starts to flag. They're bailing constantly. Right? They don't sleep. They don't really sleep in this tiny boat, six men. And, and what Shackleton does is to give all, all, five, all five of the other men hot milk so that no one knows that he's the one and is embarrassed by the one flagging. Um, they actually get to South Georgia in an extraordinary navigational feat by Frank Worsley, the navigator on board. 
It's a terrible journey to get across. The, they, they dock in on one side. They get across the island. They get to, South, they get, they get to the whaling station. And Shackleton, remember, they haven't bathed in, six, in 18 months. No one recognizes them. And Shackleton's first words are, when did the war end? And the captain of the whaling station says, it's not ended. In Europe, the world's gone mad. And because there's a war on, and because Britain doesn't care anymore about exploration, I mean, the, the individual hero right, has been wiped out you know, and the 20th century has begun really in earnest now in 1916 in the carnage of the First World War. And Shackleton has this extraordinary difficulty trying to get a boat from somewhere to go back and collect his men. It takes him, he arrives on May 10th. It takes him May, June, July, and most of August to get a vessel. He tries four that can actually get through the icebergs around Elephant Island. He goes gray during the time. He's extraordinarily worried. Um, when they, get, they eventually get to Elephant Island, all 22 men are alive. He counts them from the, shore, from the boat, from the Yelko, this Chilean vessel he's on. This picture was taken, right, when they spotted the Yelko. And this huge sense of relief, right, pours over him. I, I brought them all home. They're all coming home. And the men sail home, where they are met by cosmic indifference in London. No one cares about what they did. Interestingly enough, most of them enlist, and, and again, an extraordinary Shakespearean irony, Three, two of them are killed in machine gun fire in Flanders after going through all of this. Shackleton spends the next four years trying to make up the debts he incurred in this expedition and trying to kind of find some kind of equilibrium in a world he doesn't recognize, which doesn't care at all about him. And then in 1921, oh, these are the men, excuse me, in 1921, he decides to go south again. He doesn't, on a, on a ship called the Quest, he doesn't really have a big, big mission, but a whole bunch of men from the previous expedition say, we're going to, because guess what? It was so much fun last time, let's go again. <laughs> and again, back to like these ironies, Shacks, Shakes, uh, Shackleton has a terrible heart. They, they, they again sail south, stop in South America, get, collect, get, get themselves victualed, head to Elephant Island, I mean, head to South Georgia to collect the last stores, and Shackleton has a massive heart attack, 1921, and dies, and is buried there. Um, and, and, so he, and then he slips into the mists of historic ignominy. I mean, lots and lots of uh, school children in the UK learn about Robert Falcon Scott, one of the men who raced for the South Pole unsuccessfully. You know, until, and, and a few of them learn about Shackleton. But for most of us, Shackleton's story was largely unknown until about the ninth, early 1990s when he starts becoming interesting to us. And so, you know, you think about what's going on here. Well, again, I'm going to sum up here now with some lessons because we don't have too much time. I might have time for questions. So let me just sum up with some lessons. So um, I, think it's, I think Shackleton, well, one more comment about Shackleton. I think why Shackleton is so interesting to us, this is my theory, and it's by no means, I think, very unusual or very unique. I think one of the reasons that he's so interesting is because Obviously, endurance and this extraordinary resilience, this extraordinary imagination about how to get it done in service to the mission. But also, again, back to like, you know, I, I, I partly created this mess. It's arguable that he created a lot of this mess, if only by going south way too soon when there was so much ice. But by God, I will clean it up. With the authority I have goes the responsibility for these people and what I wrought as a leader. And again, that sense of the, the again, in, inexorable connection between authority and responsibility to the people who depend on, on and, and are in the thick of that authority is so important and so important right now. And again, we hunger for more of that now. So let me just sum up some of the lessons. In, really, these are taken kind of from both presentations, overlap, some overlap and some particular to each story. So I said this before. I think this importance of committing to a mission. We did this. Uh, Kai Rizdal and Marketplace did this session yesterday on the consumer arms race, and they had these two astounding millennials up here, the founder of Reddick and the woman who crea helped create Girls, the screenwriter. Astounding. And they kept talking about how passionate they were about having a mission, working for an organization or a group or a cause with a mission. We need big, worthy missions that commit to goodness, and then we need lots of flexibility. And we don't, we don't give up on that commitment. Right? That's, that's ironclad. But then we, then we demonstrate lots of flexibility about how we accomplish it. So I think it's, these stories, each of these men are made. They're better, tired, exhausted, right, satisfied. But, the, but, but they're better 
for the crucible of each of these moments of crisis. And, but each of them depended heavily on the use of emotional tools, forbearance, detachment, managing energy, um, resilience, persistence, uh, a sense of empathy. So the importance of those tools and using them and honing them and then, them and then themselves. The importance, Shackleton doesn't really do this, but it's so important, from Lincoln doesn't, it's so important for so many of us to frame the stakes of the moment, including the costs for the people that you lead. Keep your friends close, your enemies closer. Listen carefully. They were great listeners, both of them. Lincoln was a great listener. I worry that we're losing the ability to listen well, to just even sit and absorb. Um, the importance of leading in the field. So Lincoln was out in the battlefields all the time. That, that opening scene where he's at his depot in the Spielberg movie talking to troops, that was not unusual. He was there all the time. So getting out and away from our smartphones, back to this point that this writer made, I want to say it was Michael Sandel, but it might have been Edward Sadelsky that they talked about last night. We want to avoid right, a world in which we don't mix and mingle with people that don't look exactly like us. Um, so getting out in the field, don't forget all leaders on you, so you need to show up as your best self. I worry that we're spending so much time here that we're forgetting that, 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 that how we show up has great ripple effects. Um, Lincoln and Shackleton understood the importance of managing their team, the, this energy piece. They never lost sight of something that a lot of us, myself included, I think are doing too much running from. And that is really what's coming and what, you know, Lincoln said we will nobly save or, or meanly lose the last best hope of earth, on earth. That, you could say that about our moment right now. We will nobly save or, or meanly lose, right, this global village. And I worry that we're not, we're not brave enough to be focusing on, on these, these, the, the really important high stakes issues that call us for small, persistent actions of impact. And then lastly, these people just never gave up. They never gave up. They didn't, they didn't fall through the floorboards of doubt. They wanted to, and they didn't. They got up off their knees night after night. They didn't give up. And lastly, in different ways, each of them, this expression, muscles of moral courage, I stole unabashedly from a speech that Robert Kennedy gave in Cape Town in 1965. Now, that's another thing that's worth Googling. Oh, my God, what a speech. It's written for our time, even though he gave it six, uh, almost 50 years ago. Um, but we need muscles of moral courage. We need to flex them. We need to find them. We need to help others recognize them and find them in themselves. Um, nothing less is needed and no nothing more is needed and nothing less will do at this moment of great turbulence, great promise, and great peril. Thank you. Right? It's one, right? Pardon? I have five minutes? Okay, let me get back up. Okay, any questions or comments? You, you sir, right there. We, I think a mic is going to find itself, but until it does, just shout it out. I was into American history back in high school. Yep. You bring it back. You don't like what you're doing, I can tell. Oh my God. <laughs> But that's the problem with history. We, we, we can make it boring, but it's so exciting. Oh, it is. And these individuals are so, and they're so, you know, what did, what did Twain once say? History doesn't repeat itself precisely, but sometimes it does rhyme. It's all about the rhymes for us. You got it. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My, my privilege. Any other comments or questions? Sir? Um, well, I'm currently in love with two people that are less well-known for our age, or some of our age. I mention this woman a lot, and people don't remember what she wrote and what she did, and, and that's Rachel Carson. Qu very, very different type than these people, right? She's, she's calm, and she's quiet, and she loved cats, and she didn't have a, an entourage, she didn't have a G5, and she didn't have, she didn't, you know, her, she, didn't ha she didn't care about the corridors of power, but she did her homework. And she fought breast cancer, metastasizing breast cancer, determined to outrun it before she finished this book. And she dotted every I and crossed every T as Monsanto and a lot of synthetic pesticides maker, makers went after her. And by God, there was never a lawsuit brought successfully against that book. And that book, Silent Spring, so if you haven't met her, Google her. 
She is astounding and she's quiet. She's so different than many, many leaders. And she shows us that leaders come in astounding forms. And that book, it reminds me of what Lincoln once said to Harriet Beecher Stowe when he met her at the White House reception. So you're the little woman that started this great big war. <laughs> that book, Silent Spring, launched the modern environmental movement, not just in this country, but around the world. And I, I'm not, you know, many, many more storied, intelligent people like E.O. Wilson give her that credit. So he, the second one, less well-known indeed, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So go look up Dietrich. I'll just, one paragraph. Um, a wonderkin theological student, born in 1906, same year as Rachel Carson, incidentally, to very well-connected, intellectual, and very, very aware, uh, socially brilliant family in Berlin, um, and is on his way to being a very brilliant, pointy-headed teacher at the University of Berlin when Hitler takes power in 1933. And almost immediately, he sees what is to come. And he has the courage, muscles of moral courage, to start talking about it, right? The, what this means for the Jews and the excluded, not just in Germany, but he sees it. And he starts talking about it. And he spends the next seven years, talking about being made, in this ongoing set of conversations with himself, those are some of the most interesting things I re try to reconstruct, the conversations of leaders with themselves about their mission, trying to understand what he should do about this. And he, he tries all these different ways within an, something called the Confessing Church, which is this kind of outlying op op opposing church to the Reichskirche, with other uh, theological leaders. Don't you see? Don't you see that to be a Christian, you it's about inclusion? And we have, we have, he said three things in 1933. Listen to this. The, church, the Christian church has an obligation to call the state for account. This is right after something called the law, uh, a law passed about the civil ser service in, nat in, the nat in national socialism that basically begins the Aryan Clause. It lays the groundwork for the Aryan Clause. He says the church has three, three responsibilities. One, we must call the state to account for why it is excluding citizens and other members right, of our society and why it, why it is persecuting those. Second, we have an, an honor-bound, uh, divine responsibility to help the victims. And third, we have a responsibility to put a spoke in the wheel of that government if that government persists in such persecution. This is 1933, folks. It's the summer of 1930. He sees. And the noose just keeps tightening of National Socialism. And he's just more and more anxious. And eventually, the, story of my, the chapter of my book is the story of his transformation. Eventually, he realizes, I can't do it as a pacifist, as a Christian, as a minister, as a teacher of ministers. I can't even do it in the ecumenical movement. I have to actually get very involved in direct political right, resistance to Hitler. He joins something called the Abwehr, and he is very involved in the plot to assassinate Hitler. And he is eventually, in prison, 1943, writes some of the most amazing letters about what he's doing from prison. Notes and papers, or letters and prison, and notes from letters and papers from prison. You can buy the book; it's astounding. And then, in, and then he is linked to the Stauffenberg plot, uh, plot 19, July 20th, 1944, to assassinate Hitler. And he is he is hung, Hitler's direct order. He is hung in Flossenburg concentration camp on April 9th, 1945, about 14 days before the camp would be liberated by Allied troops. So you want to talk about someone who is the ballast of, of goodness, the ballast of what is right in a world that has lost sight of what is right. That's what Bonhoeffer does over and over again. And by the way, a whole bunch of people know that. They speared him away in 1939 because they're worried that he won't be able to come back and help rebuild Germany after the war because the Nazis will kill him. And he gets to Union Theological Seminary, and he gets set up in New York, and he's going to have a year, like, you know, a postdoc year, and he's going to... And he says, I can't stay here. I got to go back and, and work against this. And he comes back, like Frederick Douglass leaving England in 1846. When, he, when it's unsafe, he comes back because he has to do something. So he's, those are my two to offer you today. Any other comments or questions? Sir, in the kind of lavender shirt? Between the Why? Um, I think two reasons, uh, and again, forbearance, right? So imagine, right? Imagine. Everyone's talk, 
Everyone wants him to say something. So again, think of the reserves of control he had. Um, I think two reasons. One, he really wanted to try and save the damn thing. Keep the South in the Union by any hook or crook, except he couldn't promise them that they could expand slavery. That was the one door. He, that, that's how far he'd come between 1861 and 1862. Right? He's begging them. We promise not to touch slavery. You can have it everywhere you have it. We just won't. He says this in the first chapter. We just won't ask you. We just won't let you expand. So he doesn't know if he can do it, but he's, he's afraid to alienate, right, basically the South. He does correspond with Alexander Stevens, his old congressional colleague, who is now the vice president of the Confederacy, seeing what jiggle room there is. So I think that's the first reason. And I think the second reason, and probably the most important one, is he doesn't really know what to do. He doesn't, he's not sure what to do. He's not sure what to do when, when he first learns that the, the, the garrison in, Fort, in, the, in, the, in, you know, in the Charleston Harbor, Fort Sumter, is going to need to be victualed. He doesn't know what to do. And Lincoln, unlike many of us who feel like we just have to act right now, Lincoln understood that sometimes doing nothing is the best thing that you can do in service to your mission. So I, 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 I have a hard time saying that it was good that he did nothing. I'm not sure what the hypothetical is. I don't really care during that period. But I know that Lincoln benefited enormously at many points, and the, and, and the American Union benefited enormously from his ability to just sit and sometimes do nothing. Not answer the email. Not send the letter. Not take the meeting. One other example. This, sorry, now I'm, I'm getting, I haven't even had any coffee today. I'm really getting into this. So one other example. So, William Seward, who becomes again like Stanton, a big fan by the end of the war, in, in, in April of 1861, writes him a letter that basically says, so I'm, I'm going to paraphrase in modern parlance, says, look, it's kind of like, it's actually kind of like Ke uh, Kevin Klein in the movie Dave. He basically says, you don't really know what you're doing. We, you and I know you don't know what you're doing. I do know what to do as president. So you can stand in as president, and I'll actually really do the job. I'm not kidding. I you know, can't make this stuff up. Which, if you know the movie Dave, Kevin Klein plays this like imper imposter, impersonator of the president. And you know what Lincoln does? He just ignores the letter. He doesn't call Seward in. <laughs> he doesn't like say, oh, I'm ready, I can do it. He, said, he does nothing. He just holds the next cabinet meeting and completely ignores it. Power of doing nothing. Any other comments, questions? My dear in the back with the white cardi. Uh, can, I, can I be heard? Okay. Yes. Um, the issue of never give up. Do you mean adjust goals? Do you think of Vietnam or uh, Iraq? Uh, is, is, is it transition? No, I mean never give up on a worthy mi mission committed to goodness. <laughs> oh, we start with the idea that your mission is worthy and good with a capital G. Goodness. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. No, no, no. I'm not talking about obstreperousness or saving faith. I'm talking, about anything. I'm talking about goodness. I mean, he really believed, and I think many of us would, would understand that belief. It had a lot to do with how far he rose. That he was, he was trying to save the last best hope. And we know that because he gave lots of speeches. I'll just give you one example. He gave lots of speeches about what was possible in, a, in the American experiment. So in 19, 1844, you can Google this too, speech to the 44th Ohio Regiment. He says, I love this. I, I tried to write an op-ed piece for the Times on this when, the day Obama was elected. He said, I stand here as living proof that my father's son could be president. Goodness. He thought he was working for goodness. Anything else? Okay. We have to stop. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure.